this event and the residency is part of a new chapter in our programming, which is to work collaboratively with organisations and artists across the country and particularly here in, in Scotland. So we've, we've done an exhibition at the Hunterian, uh, we've worked at Glasgow International and throughout we've just, it's been so wonderful in how generous and open and collaborative our colleagues up in Scotland have been. And, it's, and we, this, this talk and this event will be the, the start of many conversations and collaborations ahead, um, I'm sure. So each residency is, is really tailored to the artists that we invite. We're very open to, to the artists and what they would like to, to do and what kind of things they would like to explore whilst they're here in Scotland. So no two residency will be the same. And we started this, this residency with Jesse Wine and the next resident will be Monica Sosnoska. Two artists who, whose work is very different but they, they share an intense curiosity and, and, and a willingness to, to learn and explore and you know, possibly fail and find different lines of inquiry, all of, all of which is completely central to, to creative work. It is, of course, about finding new forms of expression, playing with and grappling with um, materials and ideas. Um, and we hope that the residency will provide a nourishing environment um, to do that. So, Many artists have a very busy schedule of events and production and the residency um, offers the time and the space and the resources to, to take a little break from, from, that, from that very busy schedule so, so that the artists can really just play. So a few words um, about uh, Jesse. So Jesse Wine is an artist living in New York. He's from the UK um, and I won't give a kind of long list of all the amazing um, exhibitions that he's done because you can see that on, on, online but I think something that Jesse has really shown us in his practice um, is that a practice which is really quite playful but also quite taunting um, is that he, he plays with the history of sculpture but is never happy just to settle on one visual or material language. And I think we can call Jesse a real um, trickster and magician, and maybe we'll talk about being a magician and a trickster as an artist, um, because he really loves to explore and play with materials, with the space in which his uh, sculptures and works are shown, and with the audience too, which has led him to create an extraordinary body of work that whilst has mostly focused on ceramics, has also gestured towards other materials and artistic forms through his use of patterners, his inventive approach to display, often quite theatrical, and his use of, of colouring too uh, in the ceramic works um, that he's made. And now he's uh, working with bronze and with wood, uh, new directions for him. Completely selfishly, um, I wanted to hear Jesse in conversation with Tim Ingold, um, another very creative and a curious thinker. Uh, so Tim is uh, an anthropologist and until recently, I believe, was the chair of social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen, so just up the road, uh, where he was in instrumental in setting up the UK's youngest department of anthropology established in 2002. I think unlike many academics who seem to write about the world, um, I think uh, without actually ever apparently experiencing or living in it, uh, Tim's work has always been attentive to what he has called the life world in which we, like he, like all of us, live. And his, world, his work is truly written of the world. And I think he has uh, an incredible sense of responsiveness and responsibility to the, to the world and the people which he has studied. Um, Having conducted research on circumpolar reindeer herding and hunting amongst the Skolt Sami of the north, in northeastern Finland, he has since written about lines, materials, buildings, architecture, landscape, music, sound, handwriting, copying, and of course, art. Well, it, th thanks, thanks, Jesse, and it's wonderful to be able to talk to you and to talk with, uh, with this piece. And it just happened that, that last night, uh, thinking about this, 
I turned to a book that was on my shelf by an architectural theorist called Lars Boebroek. Uh, it came out uh, about a couple of years ago, called Grace and Gravity. And, um, and, and the book is, is really about how these two principles work together. Gravity about the way in which things weigh down upon one another. Grace about how things actually stand up. And I realized that this piece is a kind of uh, counterpoint, contrapuntal dialogue between these two principles. So I wanted to start by, by asking you about that. Because um, if you imagine something like a stone wall, a heavy stone wall or a brick wall, it holds in place because every stone is placed, weighs down upon the stone beneath and weighs down upon the stone beneath. And so long as the foundations are solid, the wall will hold up. But if you take a standing human body, that's not the way it stands up. A standing human body is, is, um, is held in a sort of poise, a balance, because of the balance of forces uh, of compression and tension in, in rods and springs, which are the bones and the muscles of the body. So it, it's held in that, in that balance. So that, that leg is, to me, illustrating that principle of poise and balance, whereas the pillar on the other side, more like a column, is illustrating to me the sense of things weighing down upon one another. So that's grace and that's gravity. And for Spoebrook, this, this demonstrates the alternative principles of, of horizontality and verticality. So when, we, when we, we fall into the earth like and become clay, that's, that's the horizontal. When we stand out, when we exist, which is etymologically the same as stand out, when we ex, uh, existere, it is to stand out, we, we, we reappear in the vertical. And I wonder um, how you thought about that in relation to the, the interplay of forces that makes up this work. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interestingly put because the material itself, clay, is, as you know, when you use it, is somewhat wet. Yes, and it wants to fall apart, but it also has an integrity, which you, do, which you can work with, but within certain kind of realms. And so the work sort of transcends that relationship, or well, not this work, but the material transcends that relationship in a sense, because it is at once both. It is uh, somewhat bodily, and it also has like a, a kind of independent integrity, which is what allows you know, people to throw a giant pot in you know, 15 minutes, for example. So I think it does both. And I think that for a long time, the way that I was working with the material was kind of just to experiment and kind of let it collapse, let it collapse. And then slowly you realize that if you let it collapse, it will just continue to collapse and continue to collapse. And so to kind of like find devices in order for it not to collapse became a kind of a theme in the studio. And in fact, one of the, I mean, obviously a flat surface is a good thing to work on, you know, as we know. But also the human foot actually is quite an interesting and strong kind of, as well, as we all know, uh, to, to stand on and to like build something from. And even just the ball of the foot there is, is kind of has a lot of integrity on its own. And so the, a lot of the work is sort of, a lot of the work becomes like empirical because of, the, because of what you do know and what you do experience. But I wanted to ask you about the foot. So what, what you've got there in the foot is, is, is not actually what an anatomical foot would actually look like. It's something more like a foot as we would actually experience it, perhaps if we were trying to wear high heels. And, 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 and all this bendiness here is, is a result of that. But I think the question is this, why do the foot like that rather than do a flat-footed piece? I do sometimes do a flat-footed piece, okay. but, it, the, but the work, I mean, the work feels flat-footed if you do that, you know, like, so mm. if you would like the work to feel in motion, or if you would like the, fe the work to sort of feel like it's doing something, has an agenda, then in a way, like, creating this foot that is somewhat in motion and maybe leaving, pushing away from the object, to me, like, this is maybe a little like grandiose but it gives it gives the work a sort of like an intention which expands beyond itself and maybe beyond your experience of it mm. so it is doing something and you happen to be there 
and it's trying to escape, like an athlete about to take well, off from the block, right? Yeah, it's, it's exactly. The race yeah, is yeah. about to start, so, so it's about to... And, and then off. the actual like, form of the foot is kind of... Well, it's, it's inconceivable without breaking a mm -hmm. foot. But because we know this object so well, or this thing so well that, that we all have, you can, it's actually easy to imagine it, you, a foot doing this, but in, in fact, impossible in reality. You couldn't do it in reality. Yeah, and so that kind of striking that balance, which again, like comes from the material, um, being able to do these things that you would not be able to do in reality is sort of, it, we, it is like central to kind of playing with your idea of what the work might be doing. But we don't have it here, but I know in, your other, in some of your other work that I've seen, um, you have hands. Mm. So I, I wonder whether you could say, how does, what is the difference in your experience between sculpting hands and sculpting feet, or the difference between what they're doing in your work? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I actually started making hands before I made feet, but making hands is kind of, making hands is, one of the things I was trying to do is I was trying to find hand kind of postures that were not leading or were not communicative. And there are so few, well, there basically aren't any, because in some cultures somewhere, every gesture means something. And so I've it's kind of slowly moved, moved more towards making feet because they're, they're so much less leading. And, but they are completely communicative at the same point. And I think that the, the, the like real point of interest for me is that we are so much less in control of the way that our feet communicate than we are of our hands. I mean, I'm doing it right now. But, but they are still communicating. So they sort of, in a way, belie us. Our feet could belie us. And so just watching everyone's feet became a sort of point of interest for me. And then that coming into the work, and obviously not having any shoes on them, they are naked, obviously, here, um, makes them sort of, I don't know, like true or some, you know, they, they, pro they propose that they are true, they're real, telling the truth. You'll get a chance to see the feet after. <laughs> I'm very conscious that people at the back, but after the talk, you will, you know, you have a chance to walk around mm. the sculpture. I just, before we move on to the, the next topic, um, I, I wanted to ask you about the, the about weight and heaviness, uh, because clay itself is a, is a very heavy material, in, and, and, and as you say, when it's wet, it sags. It wants, it always wants to to fall in. It is, it is literally of of the earth. Um, I have no idea how heavy this thing actually is because I'd have to to lift it up. But but we know that it's actually hollow inside, so it might not be as heavy. We, we probably, when we look at that, we probably make some sort of mental estimate of how heavy is this going to be, and and then you think, well. What is that? What is that weight? I, I, I know that it's possible to make a distinction between mass and weight. So, so mass is the amount of stuff you've got, uh, but it doesn't weigh anything as long as it's just sitting there. It only weighs when you, for example, a, a, a great rock. If it's still part of the, it's still embedded in the earth, it has huge mass, but it doesn't weigh anything. It only weighs when you quarry it out of the earth and you try to lift it, and 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 that weight is something that exists in between you and the material, because it's something you feel. Would you say, if, if I said, is this massive, or is this weighty? Is it heavy? Are these words that would feel, you would feel would apply to this kind of work, or is it all actually um, a mirage? I think it is basically all a mirage, honestly. Um, and part of that is the sort of is like a practical question, which is that I don't want anybody else to be in the studio when I'm making things, and so I have decided to make things, you know, a certain size and a certain weight that I can manage on my own. And then the mirage happens, which is the finishing of the work or the way that the work is put together. Or sometimes I would even join this work in the middle and just completely seal this. And so it will become one piece. But they are all still completely moved. They are cumbersome, is what they are. They are re they're like difficult, and the weight is away in front of you. But they're not heavy. That weight is something that we experience in movement over time in space. It's not a kind of objective property of a, of a static thing. And you're, you're very good at creating this sense that 
almost like the object is in movement or is about to move so that you have a sense of its of both its mass and weight just when you're looking at it without even sort of picking it up but yeah. in this case he's looking as so it's not the whole thing that's about to move it's 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 that the leg is about to take off yeah, yeah. but yeah. the the column has is, it is is actually static yeah. so. maybe that's a nice segue into this you being a, a trickster, which I <laughs> brought up in the introduction, so whether that's a good way of describing you, but that you have you have used clay that looks like rusted metal. I have actually picked this up when we were installing it, not not, <laughs> but um, and so I had I approached it thinking with with in one sense that this is hollow, rusty, cold metal, but then it is of course something com completely different. So you you have a real strong sense of clay but then you suggest it's something else and perhaps why why do you play with pattern as to to kind of trick the audience to deceive us in some way yeah well to begin with it was just because the thing to do with fired ceramic is glaze it and i just wanted to resist something in the process and not completely finish the work glaze is incredibly hard to control so i i sort of like stepped away from it and began to kind of reevaluate the way I might, I might finish the work and basically accidentally stepped into a much more kind of like exciting world of finishing the work in, in different materials, which kind of like, again, like, as I said at the beginning, just take the viewer away from the work. And, even, and it does it for me as well. Like I, I look at the work and I'm not seeing ceramic anymore. I'm seeing like a lot of different materials or processes. So I feel like the kind of the theatricality or the kind of like fiction in the work is is, is sort of like the fun bit in a way where you you're like examining and figuring out what it is, is to me the fun bit. So I became kind of, I, I began to do that perpetually and just get, just, it's funny, like if you can just get somebody to look at the work, like, you know, be in some way physical around the work, the experience of it is so different to just sort of standing at a distance and basically x-raying an object and saying, I know how that was made and I know which materials we used to make it and therefore I kind of, in one way or another, understand it. Mm. So I think like keeping the viewer away from that for as long as possible became sort of almost addictive for me to do that, yeah. But it, it does raise for me questions about the nature of surfaces. I mean, let's just forget this for a moment and suppose that what we had in front of us was a rusty old oil drum. So it's all completely covered in rust. Uh, it's rusty because it's been left out into the open. It's got waste, it's experienced the wind and the rain and everything. And, and you would say uh, that, that surface of that drum is very worn. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by this notion of, of the verb to wear because it has a double meaning in English. Um, so we wear clothes, but also to wear something is to erode it, to wear it down. So we can have a worn expression on our face uh, or, or be worn out. So, and, and you think, how can that be? I mean, that, that uh, it sounds like it's, it's saying some things that are completely opposite to one another. Either you put something on or you take it off. Uh, and, and, but, the, but what it tells me is something different about the nature of a surface in which actually wearing can be the same in both cases, that, that the surface what we're looking at is not something that encases or covers an object, but is actually a place where um, the inside of the object, which is metal, and the outside, which is air and rain and so on, are encountering one another, interacting one another, and forming this stuff, rust, which is a bit like the surface of the ground in that way, that it's something that is continually being formed as the constitutive forces of the earth coming from below meet the erosive forces of the weather coming from above. And in that sense, the wearing is... Is, is, is there's no contradiction. And, and so then I, I was thinking about that in relation to this and thinking, well, what, what kind of surface is this? If this, this actually was um, rusted metal, then all of that would work. And they say, yes, e exactly. This is, um, this is not a surface that covers up. It's a surface that covers mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not. But now it turns out that actually it does cover up because underneath it, is clay, but it doesn't cover up because actually the process in which you've made this rust effect has involved the uh, oxidization. It really is rust. So it really is. Yeah, it yeah. actually is rust. So you've got 
you've got both things going on at once, only the covering up bit is underneath the covering bit and not the other way around. <laughs> right? what, you, what do you think about, uh, if, if, is, is this a work that is really about surfaces rather than or the interior? Or... Yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> I think this, somehow with, with, with the process of producing ceramics, somehow the surface is so separate from the material itself because in order to combine those things, it would just completely change your process. And so I think that one of the reasons that I'm particularly interested in the rust finish is because we associate rust obviously with decay, as you say, being left out in the rain. But the environment in which this work basically lives is either, well, in a crate probably for most of its life, but then in, a, in either you know, a home possibly or in a gallery. And they are incredibly controlled environments. Mm -hmm. And so for the work to in some way express a kind of freedom from it or a life before it, I think is sort of crucial to its, crucial to its being basically. And so the fact that it kind of looks as if it has been somewhere else, when in fact it has had what is tantamount to a kid's science experiment happening to it, is, is like, you know, is kind of, I think like where it's interest, like, I think that's. But that, that raises a contradiction in itself, the, 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 co the controlled environment in which this thing has to live, because you, we can ask you, is, is this work actually finished? And that's to say that the, 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 the controlled environment would like to keep it exactly as it is Finished. now, yeah. but, but actually the whole point is that it isn't. Yeah, totally. And, uh, yeah, and I think when you're making things, you have this like, idea that le like, the life of the object continues in mm. some way. And so to kind of imbue like, a sense of consciousness within the work might be done by you know, this foot doing something else, so it kind of like, has the sense that it you know, has its own prerogative. But another way that I've been kind of thinking about it is through the surface where, you know, if we were in, um, I don't know, like a house in the Amazon, the surface of this work would be slightly different because the moisture in the air would just be completely different. The humidity would change the work. So there is a kind of like, although this is a kind of outfit for the work, the outfit is the bit that has the conscious, you know, like a, a sensitivity to the environment in which it's displayed. Because I was just thinking about, um, David Nash's sculptures of wood, where, he, where he, quite often he makes boxes or ladders out of green wood, or basically wood that's not yet been fully seasoned, so that then over time it will split and crack and warp and bend, yeah. and so that the, the sculpture has a long lifespan and is, is always changing very, 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 very slowly. And I, um, but that's wood. Mm. And, and this is this rather fascinating difference, which I'm sure you're just beginning to explore now, between wood and clay, oh, yeah. although, you know, wood, we both come from the land, um, but they're really very different in that regard because um, wood actually is a, a living material. It's made out of, out of, out of organic cells. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of water in it. And clay is sort of different. I was trying to put my foot on, finger on, on sorry, put my foot on. <laughs> that was a, a real, I was trying to put my foot on the question of, <laughs> of what really makes wood different from clay. Do you, would you have the feeling that, that clay is sort of inanimate compared with wood? Or would you feel really there's not so much difference between them? I think, I think that there is actually it's not as inanimate as you may think. Mm. So one of the like terms when you a, a sort of technical term for clay is that it, people often say it has memory. Mm. And by that, they mean that if you have bent a piece of clay this way and then you flatten it and you put it in the kiln, that memory will come so, back to kind of put you. <laughs> so it's like a specter within the material almost. And so a lot of the time you're kind of working against that, you know, ex expression and quality that the material so has. If you were to compare that with I mean, if this is pretending to be metal in some way, uh, or bronze, for example, which is another very sculptural material, would that be fundamentally different? Yeah, I think it would be fundamentally different. I mean, to me, it's like all process. You know, it's, it's about the process by which you mm. kind of, the, that you went through in order to get to the end of the thing. Yeah. The end, well, the end of the thing as you know it, at least. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to think of a, so you use the word pretending and then it made me think of attending. Um, and when you have these double things going on that you're aware it's one material but it, it is also another at the same time. And when you use these tr tricks and illusions it compels you as a, as a viewer to attend to the work again and again and again because you have a sense that you haven't quite understood it. You haven't, you haven't said, ah, oh, it's clay, ah, oh, it's metal. That you, have a, you have a sense that it's, it's always, it's something ambivalent. It's positioned between two potentials. It could, it could be metal or it could be clay. And one thing about that is that it makes you more attentive to the work so that the work continues to live in another way in, in the viewer that you, that people want to keep looking, keep want, wanting to keep explore the work. And I thought this play with pattern and illusion is, I'm just thinking to bring us on to the, the final section that we, were, we wanted to address today, um, is something that can encourage a form of attentiveness and curiosity, um, which is, of course, at the root of making a work for you, that you have to be attentive to the clay, to the wood, um, and be curious about its materials and forms in order to, to, to be sort of properly responsive to it. So I just wanted to, that was, that was less a question, just a, 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 a chapter three of the next part of the, because Tim, you've written a lot about attention and, atten and attending to, so maybe you can expand a bit more on that. Well, we were talking about some of your other work where you've got lots of hands and feet sort of coming up out of something that looks a bit like a, a mattress. And one of the questions we, we, we had was, to what extent, when, a, when somebody comes along to look at the work, uh, are they welcomed in? Or is their experience more like they're being an interloper or an eavesdropper on a conversation that parts of the work are having with themselves. So you have all these hands and feet and they're having a, they're having a little, a little um, sorry, we're having an in-house conversation amongst ourselves, thank you very much. Uh, you have no business here. Or um, do, join, do join in. And, and um, so there's a certain ambivalence about some of, some of those works we were looking at. So if we, if we look at this work here where we don't have hands and we have what looks like an escape attempt um, that is being held back by the bum. Well, two things really. First of all, suppose I'm a viewer and I come in and look at this. Then do I feel myself part of the event? Or do I feel that I am just happen to be looking through a keyhole at something that's not part of me at all? That was one question. I think the other that's related to it is, is where does the air belong in all this? Uh, so so f um, if it were a human body, you'd think actually the body, you, you, human beings are not limited to the body because there's all this air that they're breathing, which we don't actually see, but is very much a part of it. Do, does this kind of work, when it's glazed and covered, up, covered in the way it's done, does it breathe? Does it, is, it, is it involved in a dialogue with its immediate environment, or is it closed in upon itself? I think it's proposing that it's involved in a dialogue. Then what kind of dialogue is it? Well, I think one of the, one of the nicer descriptions that somebody has given me of my work is that certain parts of it put you back in your body. And what they meant by that was like the knee pit or the ankle or these kind of weaker points, which sort of everybody's like sensed a pain in, let's say, or sen you know, sensed a pain and then not a pain. So you have like a good context of sort of feeling in that part of the body. And so I think at those points, and, and funnily enough, when I'm making it, there are also the points where the work will often break or you'll have problems that are, are exactly the same in the human body and you can fix them with steel rods and things, which are basically what we do to our bodies um, in surgery. So. I think that the kind of dialogue exists in these smaller places within the work. I don't think that it kind of has a like definitive and clear communication. But I think as you kind of like get close to it and inspect it and you kind of like sense the feeling of having that limb or having that ankle or having your knee in that posture, I think that's where it begins to communicate. Mm. And the first question, you're much better placed to answer than me because you're the viewer. 
and I'm the artist. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, something that just crossed my mind only just now, and which is really beyond my competence to comment on, but, but I kept thinking about these uh, religious devotional images of the crucifixion, uh, where you have a, a Christ on the cross, uh, and, and you would look at the legs and the arms, uh, and they're pinned up to this cross, perhaps wanting to get away from it, mm. that's what it suddenly brought to mind. The, 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 um, the, the uh, tension between the utter rigidity of the cross, in which you know, it would be solid beams mm. uh, and completely immobile, and the, and the wriggliness, the, the wanting to, to, the, to, to flee, the, the escape feeling of the body, so um, it, it, it's almost as though, uh, if I were a viewer then, I would think of, that, of, of this as a very powerful feeling of the, the way in which a body really resists being pinned down, being crucified in that kind of way. I don't know, it's, it just occurred to me, thinking about it, that, um, that that's a rather powerful image. And, but what I don't know about, I was going to ask you about, is the hole in the top. What's the point of that? Well, you, <laughs> what is the point of that? Well, usually I really resist putting holes in my work because it just is so leading and it, it just, it, it's British modernism. It becomes Barbara Hepworth, that moment, you know, like, and you can't, that is hers, you know, and you can't fight that in a way. But this was shown in an exhibition of a, about eight works and uh, this was the final work that was produced for it. And often when you're producing like the final work for an exhibition, you're sort of maybe very consciously trying to kind of tie it up or something. And I think that the whole is this a purposefully played out gesture that is used and overused. Um, and then the, and, and the other part of that is that you can see through, suddenly this thing is not as solid as it was basically. You can see through if you're tall enough. Yeah, you you have to be tall like time. you. Yeah, it's yeah, not, no, yeah, not good I for think. short people. Well, even when you look at the work, it's like divided into quadrants, yeah. which are completely separate from one another. Mm. And they're almost kind of against one another. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. They exist in tension. And because they exist in tension, and something in tension or something in suspension is, is not something static, but something that is ongoing. Mm. And there you have the kind of sense of the life of the work that you can't control and pin it down, even if you couldn't control to an extent the environment in which it lives. And so if, since we're, I'm, I'm timekeeper, so we don't, we, we start a little bit late. So I'm gonna open this up to the, the floor. Yeah, I was intrigued by, um, you talked about moving on from hands to feet, because hands were, I think you said too, they communicated too much and they lead too much. And I just wondered why you want to, What's the intention to avoid that? I think the intention to avoid that is that the, the work becomes something specific to certain people it, just from like a hand gesture or a hand movement. So I, I don't know if you know this uh, Bruno Minari book of like Italian hand gestures, for example. There are all, the, you know, tons of gestures and they mean tons of things. But it, it, you know, that it's sort of maybe a little sort of more famous in Italian culture that hands communicate more than they do in other cultures. But I don't think it's actually true. I just think that the Italians are very expressive and talk about it a lot. So what I didn't, I, I just didn't, I realized when I was making hands that you can't kind of separate the hand from it meaning something somewhere. Whereas the foot is sort of, it can be like at once timid and confident. But I, I think I'm asking why do you want, as an artist, why do you want to avoid that? What What's, what's your intention? Because I want the work to be more abstract than that. I don't want it to be located super specifically. I don't want it to sort of, to me, it's almost like you would write something on the work, do you know, if you have the hand in a very specific gesture. And, and so actually one of the gestures that I use more than any other, is just this kind of somewhat re like religious gesture like this. But the way that I try to position it is that you, instead of seeing it like that, straight on, that you see it like that. So you are the person doing it. So it just, it, so it sort of changes your role in relation to the gesture, you know? So instead of thinking, what does the gesture mean? You sort of think like, wow, now I'm making the gesture, you know? So it just moves it around. 
I think self-portraiture is also really important in your work, which, I mean, Tim has really opened up the work, I think, in an amazing way. Um, but I think also you talk about self-portraiture in the work with um, things that are within your life and family. And I, th I think that that is such a huge part of the work. So it's, can you talk about that maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, the self-portraiture sort of began as, you know, literal self-portraiture and it's kind of become a sort of a storytelling, if you like. So with this works kind of loose, but my introduction to art was with my mum going to Tate Liverpool mainly. And so, as you can imagine, there was just a lot of focus on British modernism in the 80s there. And so I think like that's where the kind of, my like base language comes from. And so in this instance, the Hepworth kind of reference talks to, talks to my childhood. And I think also the, the kind of fascination with body and gangly limbs is because I have really gangly limbs. So like the, the storytelling is, yeah, or the self-portraiture is not kind of literal. It's more just like becomes experiential or a, another work which includes my dad's house and it was shown alongside a work that includes my mum's house and they were shown in New York at the same time and they were kind of equidistant to what they are in Chester where I grew up as to what they were in New York. So it was this idea that they were kind of, the houses were then existing, you know, on the other side of the world, but almost in the same, you know, capacity. They weren't the real houses, they were about this big. But you sort of had this idea of place or your kind of traveling between the two exhibitions was sort of really visceral for me somehow. I was like, oh yeah, this is what it was like traveling between two homes growing up. So yeah, so the, the self-portraiture manifests itself in a slightly more abstract way than it used to, but it's definitely still there and it's yeah, so If you put that alongside what Tim was talking about, it's really interesting because your self-portraiture is in disguise. You mean in terms... Like the sculptures are disguised as something else they're not. You know, and, and that's what I find quite interesting about this sort of the way that Tim's exposed something within sculpture. Um, and you are not necessarily intending that, but you're talking about something else. And I kind of feel that that, that really makes something quite interesting, I think. Well, yeah, and maybe just something that you can't, well, or that I can't kind of consciously control because, it's, because it is just there. And I think that whenever I finish work, I, I like have this idea that I'm like sealing it by oxidizing it or by, you know, applying one of the, like a graphite finish or a paint finish. I feel like I'm sealing it, but in fact it, and, and that kind of makes me think about what you're saying there, Toby, about like how I don't think it's in the work anymore because I'm kind of like flattening it out by sealing it. But of course you can't kind of get away from the fact that the information is in the work, especially if it's a sculpture which is uh, representational in some way. And first of all, I just want to thank three speakers for constructing this beautiful moment, you know, being attentive, as uh, uh, Eve said earlier on, around the one piece of work, which is really, really interesting as a structure of a talk. Um, secondly, it's just perhaps observation, and uh, I was quite interested in what Tim talked about. Um, did Tim mentioned something, being part of an event, and I really loved that notion of events, you know, say um, even the moment of encountering with this piece of work or during the making as an artist, you know, turning clay into something else. So I wonder, Tim, um, did you think about um, the notion of event in the sense of Alan Baju talked about events as a moment of a rupture and the breaking through, thinking about you know, that sort of, uh, you know, contemplation when, when one encounters. I, I don't think I was, I wasn't reflecting deeply on the idea of, of event, but uh, it was a question of, well, the, thing, the thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently in my own work is what I've been calling correspondence, which means when rather than meeting things, you're going along with them and responding to them as you go, like writing letters to people. You, you get a letter, you send a letter, you get one back, and, and, and it carries on like that. 
uh, in which case you know every event is just is just a moment in that ongoing uh, conversation uh, as distinct from uh, the sort of event that marks a rupture in the flow and I think in relation to this uh, what I, I was wondering and also in relation to other works of Jess's uh, where it wasn't entirely clear whether the um, the viewer the attender is somebody who's being welcomed in or is being told to uh, Told, told to clear off because you're, you're an interloper in our, our little private conversation and there seemed to be a bit of both. And, and so in those terms, it's a question of whether the moment at which you set eyes upon a work is just a, a moment in a long conversation that's going on anyway or whether it is something that marks a break, a shock, a sudden whoop. Um, I've come to the wrong place moment or opened the wrong door. These, these sorts of moments, um, is, it, is it one of those or is it trying to be both at once? It's, yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, it has to be both at once. Yeah. I think it just has to be. It's the only way that, you know, it's like the idea of practice. Where even if you're completely disparate from one piece to the next, you still need a dialogue that happened and you still hope for that moment of shock or, well, shock, of... Something happening. Abrupt, abrupt, yes, something. Yeah, yes. something happening. Something that, that gives a jerk yeah. in, the, in the process. Mm. So I think we have time just for one more from the back, and then we'll wrap up. <clears throat> Hi, I'll try to keep this quick. Um, it was just whether you're ready to talk about what you've been working on while in residence or any part of that, uh, continuing on this idea of correspondence, I suppose, and if you're working with others, how, like what, what is the in progress at the moment? If you're ready to talk about any part. Yeah, I can talk about it, definitely. <laughs> you, can't, you can't say anything, but yeah, I can talk about it. We've been, while here, we've been like looking at these ideas of the monstrous. And so, um, you know, this works kind of like a good example of, of like a departure point where the work is a hybrid of a number of things at once. And so Yates and I have done a lot of research around, uh, around plants and kind of um, in both indigenous and quote unquote invasive species and how these, how, these, um, how these worlds collide and especially how these worlds collide in relation to this place, the castle, which, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these kind of big homes would have had gardens that were created by collecting plants on grand tours and the way that those gardens would be controlled is by um, sort of having an extremely manicured uh, lawn or gravel or whatever around them and so they would like remain separate from the environment in which they exist and so at what point do they kind of cross over and at what point do they kind of remain I mean like examples of and, and Scotland is particularly interesting with this because you can grow things here that you can grow in the Himalayas. When the world is sort of dramatically changing around us, how um, this kind of idea that if something is flourishing, you know, like maybe maybe you should pay attention to it rather than try to get rid of it, consciously try to get rid of it. And so to that sort of, what, what that's kind of resulting in in terms of work is I've been uh, making, I've been like casting le like t leaves, like actual leaves from trees and then trying to make sort of these very small monstrous um, combinations where the leaves are attached to like a bronze shoelace or something like that. And so I'm just trying to, I'm trying to kind of literally make a hybrid. a hybrid, yeah, yeah. A stable hybrid, yeah. Well, that's, that's a really nice note to end on, also to be attentive to what is flourishing. We're, I'm gonna thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Tim, so thanks so much. <laughs>